Josh Gibbs. Tonight we are picking up where we left off with James Snap Jr. And we're going to be talking uh, textual variants, um, a couple of specific variants, and then we're going to get into confessional bibliology and uh, pick up kind of um, in that area of the dialogue. But stay with us and uh, we'll get going in this. Make sure today that you leave this place knowing that you are saved to the glory of God. Thanks. That one I'm going to choose. If you believe that, friends, you don't know the gospel. Is that the wonder of the cross is that no one gets injustice. If you, if you end up under the wrath of God, it is because you've rejected his provision for you and you are justly punished for your sin. To what the scriptures teach. I think the Bible does teach that God desires the salvation of all men. He has provided uh, for uh, the, the salvation of all men. And therefore, anyone who, who ends up under the wrath of God, it is because they have rejected his provision for them. And they are justly punished for their sins. The question that pro seeks to provide an answer to this question, for whose sins did Jesus die? The extent of the atonement asks the question, for whose sins did Jesus die? There are only two answers, two possible answers to that question. Either Jesus died for the sins of some people, or Jesus died for the sins of all people. Awesome. Hey, welcome back, James Snap. It's been a while since we last spoke. It's good to have you on. It's good to be here again. I know. It seems like it's just been so long. Um, but, yeah, just two days, or just 24 hours, so I had to recenter my um, my camera there. But I'm trying to start this watch party in the New Testament, the NT Text Criticism uh, Facebook group, and for whatever reason, it's saying I cannot start a watch party in there right now so i'm not sure what the deal is on that do you need to approve it first let, let me go on there and see if i can approve it okay or if, if that can even be done hmm that's weird you hear the jeopardy music i wonder if i try it on a different computer if that'll work i'm saying watch party did you see it? Watch party. What was? Yeah, I was trying to start a watch party. I, I did not. But if I, if I do say introduce watch party, and say start watch party, what what will happen next? Uh, it should just well, start a watch party. Yeah, in the group, it'll it'll go in there live. Um, not seeing anything. It's not happening. Okay, let me try this again. Well, will I, will I need a link to your channel? Do what? Do I need a link to your channel to put in there? I've never used it. I never used that option before. No, yeah. you shouldn't have to. It should automatically send you as uh, as the admin the option to um, approve it or not. So that's kind of strange. I don't know. I don't know why it wouldn't. Here, I'm trying to do it in a on a different computer. I think that might be. Maybe that has something to do with it. Okay. Hey. Okay, that worked. Okay. That's weird. See, it It wouldn't let me do it on my iPad, but it is letting me do it on my other Mac. Okay. Yeah. I'm not seeing it up there, but if you've got it, then... Well, so you've got it. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so, so jump, jump back to the main screen here. Well, you just rose. Oh, I'm type in here i'm sorry what's up totality of scripture i see you're with us um glad to have you in we're gonna it, we're gonna have a chance for anyone who is viewing live i just want to get this feed out there um for those different facebook groups who want to join as well so they can uh, join in on some of the questions at the end if they would like to so um just bear with us for just a second um
that's the only problem with doing these things live. You can't start a watch party until the actual um, until the actual feed goes live. So that's kind of the bad part about it. Gosh. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna we're just gonna do it in the NT text criticism group for now. For whatever reason, it's not letting me do any watch parties on my iPad. So we'll just jump into it. But um, so yeah, um, James Snap, welcome back. It's really good to have you. Uh, we kind of did our test run last night and worked out a few of the bugs, which I did. There was one thing when we did the screen share um, in some of the podcasting platforms, it actually had a little bit of an echo um, for whatever reason. So I emailed that the admin or the tech team um, for the software company that I'm at, and they actually did a whole new update just for that particular problem this afternoon. So I did the update. They said it should fix it. If it doesn't, uh, for those of you guys who are streaming live, if you could just send a message in the, in the live chat and let me know, like, hey, there's an echo, there's not an echo, um, that, that'll that allow me to send them the diagnostics if you want to help us with that so they can try to fix that bug for everyone who d does live streams like this. So anyways, so what we're going to get started with tonight, we're just going to hit the big one first. We're going to do First John 5.7. The comma, yeah, name. You can't hear me? It was getting a little underwater there. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. Okay. I turned the gain up on my mic. So, yeah, we're going to jump into 1 John 5, 7 right from the start. And uh, I'm going to lead us off here and just kind of give uh, some of the information that I've got. This is probably um, the biggest text variant that is is discussed today. I mean, there's... Mark 16, the ending of Mark, you've got the comma yone, and then you've got the pericope adulteri in, in uh, John 7, 53, 3, 8, 11, that are the big three. And then you've got other ones that we, we're going to look at if we get a chance. Uh, for instance, what we had talked about last night in Colossians 1, 6. Um, but let me just give you some of the information that I've got, and, and I'll first tell you the position that I hold, uh, which is... Um, what's called by some people the canonical text, others it's called the confessional text. Um, I, I prefer TR, the TR text, or canonical text, whatever you want to call it. But um, that's the position that I hold. And, and obviously, um, 1 John 5, 7 is, is uh, one of the least witnessed to um, passages that is a variant um, in the Bible. And there's a lot of discussion about that for a lot of reasons. But um, let me let me give you a few of the reasons why I think that it should be in there, and this is going to be from Thomas Golda. There's there's a number of different um, references that I want to give, but here's what it says in the King James. It says, "For there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one." And it, he says this 1611 KJV preserves this verse as other Bibles do not. And he says, three bear record um, or witness in heaven. The oneness doctrine is a fault is false, where they say Jesus is the Father and vice versa. So there's there's differences there, but the Trinity is 100% true. So this is this is a verse um, when you're looking at the doctrinal attestation to it. You've got you've got a, kind of a comparison between, or not? It's not a comparison. It's a contrast between the earthly witness and um, uh, verse. Six, I want to say. I don't have it pulled up in front of me. Uh, but then you've got the heavenly record, which is this verse, where it's, where you've got um, uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Um, and then he goes on to say that it, it carries the doctrine of the Trinity as being three persons that bear record in heaven, and these three are one, representing the one God. So you've got the doctrine of the Trinity in this one verse, obviously. But um, when you're considering the, the external and the internal witness, there's... There's there's a lot of different um, kind of conjecture about how many actual Greek manuscripts do or did have um, this particular phraseology in those manuscripts and what was actually used in the TR. You can see uh, a lot of different um, points that are made in that. Um, I'm not really speaking very clear, so I'm sorry. I'm going to try to get my thoughts together. But, um, yeah, so there, you can see a lot of different information that's coming in on what they had when when Erasmus was um, putting together what we know today as the TR, and it, you've got his annotations on it, but you've also got a lot of other um, information to consider when it comes to the total number of manuscripts. Now, this guy, 
Thomas Golda, he says that there was 10 total out of about 500 that contained 1 John 5. And uh, it goes on to say that the Greek text includes, it would be 629, which is 14th century, um, minuscule 61, uh, 16th century, 918, 16th century, and then you've got a couple 17th, 11th, 12th, 15th, and 14th centuries. Um, but the thing about 1 John 5, 7 is it, you can trace it back all the way to the Waldensian church, uh, to the translation of the Old Italic all the way in the 2nd century. You can see it in the 7th century in 12 Old Latin manuscripts. You can see it in the 8th century in at least 21 Old Latin manuscripts, in the 9th century in at least 189 Old Latin manuscripts. So there's over 6,000 Latin manuscripts that remain unexamined to this day. But 1 John 5, 7, it was referred to going all the way back to 200 AD, where Tertullian quoted it in his apology against Praxius. In 250 AD, Cyprian of Carthage, he wrote, And again, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it is written, and the three are one. Uh, and he, he wrote on this, in his um, on the lapsed, on the novations. Now, Cyprian, he's quoting and says, It is written, and the three are one. He lived from 180 to 250 A.D., and the scriptures he had at that time contained the verse and the question. So this is at least 100 years before anything that we have today in the Greek copies, period. If it wasn't part of the Holy Scripture, then my question would be, where did he actually get it? In 350 A.D., you've got Priscillian who referred to it in his Corpus Scriptorum Ecclesiasticorum Latinorum. or It's Latin, so you get the point, though, where he says this, and there are three which give testimony on earth, the water, the flesh, and blood, and these three are in one. And there are three which give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one in Christ Jesus. That's Priscillian in 380 AD. In 350, um, Dacius Clarus referred to it in his Patrologia Cursus Completus. Uh, that's Latin, but that was in 350 AD. Also in 350, Athanasius referred to it in his De Incarnation. Uh, I know I'm butchering that Latin there, but <laughs> just get, cut me some slack. Then you've got in 380 AD as well, Priscillian in Liber and the Apologeticus quotes, and there are three which give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. These three are one in Christ Jesus. Now you've got in 398, Aurelius Augustine used it to defend the Trinitarianism and De Trinite against the heresy of Sibelianism. Then you've got 450 AD, the Council of Carthage. Carthage. Um, they used 1 John 5, 7 and quoted it um, in, in their council um, in 415 AD by Eugenius, who drew up the Confession of Faith for the Orthodox, quote-unquote. It reads with the King James. Now, how did the 350... How did 350 prelates in 450 A.D. take a verse to be orthodox that couldn't have been in the Bible? So it seems to me that it had to exist there from the beginning as it was quoted as pater verbum et spiritus sanctus. And in order that we may teach until now, we may clearly, clearly then light that the Holy Spirit is now one divinity with the Father and the Son. It is proved by the evangelist John, for he says there are three which bear testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And then you've got testimony from 450 uh, A.D. to 530 A.D. with uh, the Anchor Bible and the Epistle of John. Then you've got several Orthodox African writers quoted the verse and defended the verse. Um, from 450 to 530, that would be Vigilius Tepensis. Uh, then you've got Victor Vitensis, Fulgentius, and the Heavenly Witnesses. Um, and so on and so on. You can trace it in 500 AD with Cassiodorus, 527 Fulgentius quoted it, 550 the Speculum has it, 636 Isidore of Seville quotes the verse, 750 Wien Burgensis quotes it, and then in AD you've got Jerome's Vulgate. <clears throat> now the Waldensians had it in their Bible, and their Bibles actually um, can, can be traced all the way back to 157 AD. But among the faithful that quoted it, here's a list of guys that you've got. Cyprian, 250, Priscillian, 385, Jerome, 420, and so on and so on. But um, so many, so many, even contemporaries would hold to it as, as being authentic. Andrew Fuller, Matthew Henry, Thomas Middleton, Louis Gossin, Frederick Nolan, 
Robert Dabney, Herman Hoskier, George Ricker Berry, Edward F. Hills, David Otis Fuller, Thomas Holland, Michael Maynard, and Daniel Waite. So the evidence of 1 John 5 7 to me it seems to be uh, <laughs> it seems to me um, to be authentic. I did want to say this. George Travis claims to have documented 31 Greek manuscripts that bore witness to 1 John 5 7 in his letters to Edward George Gibbon in, for, in Forgotten Books on page 285 is where that's quoted. And uh, it, it goes on to say, one must never think there's only nine Greek manuscripts that contain the passage. So the Greek does testify to the witness of 1 John 5 7. It also is cont- it, it's also attested in the Old Latin. When the scriptures were written in Greek, they were very soon thereafter translated into Latin. The reason that Latin, like the Greek, was a universal language. So most scholars agree that the Old Latin New Testament was translated from the Greek around the second half of the second century. So some even before that. The time range is from 137 AD to 150 AD. So soon after the Bible was completed, the Greek scriptures were translated into Latin. And copies of the Old Latin we have today are from the 6th century and the 13th century. And they're copies that go as far back to the 2nd century. So you've got, here's six of the main Old Latin copies that have it. It would be uh, Monacensis 64, Speculum, Colbertinus, uh, Demidovinianus, Divionesis, and Perpinensis, if I've said that correctly. But um, now you've got... Colbertinus in there, something too. Do what? Uh, six, six to nine. There should be a auto BM, BM, Codex Auto B. I forget. <laughs> there's, there's another one in there that starts with Auto. Just call it Codex Auto. And then just say NCIS or. Yeah, okay. Okay, auto so. BM. Yeah, you've got all this information. But, okay, so now in addition to the old Latin, the Latin Vulgate has 1 John 5 7. Um, and out of every 50 manuscripts, 49 actually contain 1 John 5, 7 in the Vulgate. Um, now, the, Jerome's Vulgate did not contain 1 John 5, 7 because Jerome himself admitted it should be there. Or Jerome himself did admit it should be there, but you've got a difference between Jerome, Jerome's Vulgate and, and Jerome's Old Latin Vulgate. Now, how can he admit it was there if it never existed to begin with? Many accused Jerome of corrupting the Bible. There are over 8,000 Latin Vulgate manuscripts, and over 98% of them contain 1 John 5.7. In the English-speaking world, 1 John 5.7 was never brought into question until 1881. And uh, you and I were kind of talking about this. Uh, that's not really true. Well, not in 1 John 5.7 particularly, but what we were talking about, um, some of the, the things that happened in 1881 um, that you know may cause you to question what actually was included and what wasn't included, not particularly in 1 John 5, 7, um, but something to consider. And it says that the, at the same time, moderate apostate translations started to appear. And obviously, you start to see wording like that. And the reason that wording comes into play is because it, it seems to be that there are some uh, verses that have, have obviously documented historical use throughout church history that seem to have um, seem to have been changed. So... Anyways, now the Greek Church had um, the Greek Orthodox Church to this day uses only the King James Bible when using an English version of the New Testament. They will not endorse any of the other English translations. This should not shock people who support modern translations, as most of the English-speaking world rejects the King James and First John five seven. Um, and then you've got let's see here. Byzantine manuscripts have always been the manuscripts of the Church. That's why all the early church fathers quoted first, not all. That's why nearly all of the early church fathers quote First John 5, 7. I think there's some that I I think I quoted. Yeah, pretty much everybody I've already talked about there. Um, oh. But you've got the Syrian Bibles, the Slavic Bibles, the Russian Bible, the Celtic, the French, the Gallic, the German, pro- all prior to Luther, the Telt Bible of the 14th century Bohemia, the Swift. Well, Sw- pretty much all the Bibles that have been based on a Latin base text. Uh, I think would would simply be. What about the, the Geneva or the bishops or Wycliffs or Tyndales? Likewise, they, 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 those are echoes of the source they had. Right. Um, let me see. What else did I have? There's six years. Okay. So Dr. McIntosh and Dr. Twyman in 1887, just six years after the revised version came out, discovered an old Latin manuscript dating back to the time of Constantine the Great. This is the only complete Latin manuscript and the oldest. The dating of this manuscript would be around 325 to 330 AD, 
This specific manuscript is marked by the emperor's name, Constantine the Great. This is stored in the Library of Constantinople. These two men were able to view... <laughs> Do what? Time out a second. You're clearly reading a prepared statement. Uh, this particular part, uh, if somebody were to say prove it, how would you go about proving that that manuscript is real and how, how do you verify your source there? Um, I don't know. How do you verify any source? I, I, I well, think when somebody says that they've got a manuscript from the 300s, usually they have a picture of it or something. Or they say, look at this wonderful discovery we've made. It is not a secret uh, that we're keeping in a vault somewhere. Uh, you go to this museum or this library and, and somebody can look at it or take pictures of it. Um, so it says that it's in the library. It, uh, it, it, this is stored in the library of Constantinople. So yeah, yeah, where is that? What are they talking about? Well, Do you have any evidence that this is a true story that somebody hasn't made up that entire story that you're saying now? Well, I don't. I mean, I haven't been there to look at it myself, so I've I've just got to take the word for it. Who has? Who is your source? How you how do you how you document that? Yeah. So, so the sources sources being lined up here, and it all seems like a strong case, but when you actually look at say Tertullian, you'll see that Tertullian doesn't actually quote the comma Johannium. He doesn't quote that part of the verse. What he quotes can just as easily be a quotation from John chapter 10, verse, verse 30, uh, if you look at the details. And I think that what we have here in, in this list of witnesses that you're giving is a couple of things. Number one, a simple misquotation. Uh, Athanasius? When? Where? Where's the source? Where do, we, where, where do we have the evidence that he wrote the composition that you're attributing to him? Uh, that's just one example of, of many. But uh, but also, um, it's readily granted that of the sources that go back to a form of the old Latin that circulated in North Africa, that the Comma Johannium was there, and it was the standard in the text, in the Latin text in North Africa by the Council of Carthage that took place in 484. That's why Eugenius and, and some of the other sources are just you know, echoes of Eugenius. Um, when, he, when he has this statement prepared, it's not like all 350 or so bishops got together and they made the contribution to that statement that he had prepared for the council. Uh, Eugenius was the, the leader, and it would be natural for him to use the text that he expected everybody else to be using, but that shouldn't be interpreted necessarily as them affirming. Eugenius expected them to recognize it, but it's going a bit too far to say, oh yeah, those 350 guys definitely did. Uh, Eugenius expected them to, but at the council was kind of thrown into disarray after it had sh shortly after it had been convened. So uh, Eugenius is there definitely as a source. I think you can go further and say Eugenius expected that to be the normal form of the Latin text of First John that was circulating in North Africa, and uh, and that takes us pretty far as far as we want to know what was the North African text. Excuse me, what was the old old, old Latin text circulating in North Africa in the 400s? You could probably drive that back a little bit further to the early 400s, maybe in the late 300s. But getting from there to saying, and this is what John wrote in Greek, uh, that's a pretty big gap. Um, let me see here. I'm now, trying to back to that manuscript that you mentioned. Uh, please just. Well, I mean, so that's kind of a tough thing to say. I mean, all I can do is quote the guys um, who are saying that it does exist. Um, and, and that's, I, I think at the end of the day, you you would have, um, kind of dueling so, authorities on who would so say it does or who would. Out, dueling authorities. One group says they have a manuscript somewhere that's really important that will transform what all the scholars have been saying for the past 150 years or so. And this would completely bend to a point of view, but it's just stored away in a library. We can't show it to you. So here's, here's where the, the testimony would be at. It's in... I'm sorry, it, it says that it's in the Archon volume, page 60 and 61, Dr. Frederick Nolan. Wait, the Archon volume? The Archon volume? That's what it says, you know yeah. what the Archon volume is? I'm just reading what it's what it says on there. No, I don't okay. know what the Archon volume is. I'm just reading what they're saying. Uh, we, ha we, we are in a world that has the internet. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll use the time more productively and leave it to others to look up the Archon volume. In well, tell me what it is. I mean, it sounds you're kind of acting like I should know what it is. It's fake. It's fake. I don't know what it, but what is it? Um, 
it's it's a thing that would get us way off topic. Okay. All right. Well, um, so did you want to present a case against first round five seven? Um. Well, I was I was gonna kind of approach it more angularly, but but sure. Um, at my blog and also the MeWe site, uh, there's a paper that's free to download, and also in the files of the New Testament textual criticism, uh, NT textual criticism rather, um, where I present uh, five essays on the Comma Johannium, and in the course of those five essays, I just basically slowly walk through the materials that have usually been presented from a pro 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 uh, C C J. Uh, I'm just saying, calling it C J for for short because because we're close. Uh, going through the evidence that's presented for the C J and saying this doesn't really say what I think it means. It says like Tertullian, for instance. Uh, he doesn't quote from the part of the verse that says, you know, the Father, the Word, and the, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Uh, just look at what Tertullian says, and you'll see it's what he says is much, much shorter than that, and it looks just as much like it can be John 10, 20 as it can of uh, uh, 1 John 5, 7. But the point is that it's not quoting the, the CJ itself. That's, that's, it's just not there in his quotation. Uh, and regarding Cyprian, um, the first essay you'll find among, among those series that I, that I mentioned, uh, there, uh, both on my blog and, and in the files, is what is Cyprian saying when he says that John in First John talks about the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because in Cyprian's text, the old, the old Latin text of North Africa, what you have in what we know as verse 8, uh, sometimes in the Latin manuscripts, you might see it before verse 7, sometimes it comes after. So, so I'll just say the, ver the verse that we know of as, as verse 8, just for clarity's sake, and regarding where it is in, in each particular manuscript or each particular witness, you kind of have to go case by case because it varies. But in, in that uh, verse, you see these, these three, what we'd call the three earthly witnesses, because we have the, the expanded text. Um, the, uh, the, you have the, the water, and then you have the blood, and then you have the spirit. Or do you? When you, when you pick up a, a typical main, uh, copy as, as we know it, it's a different order. But in the text that was used in, in North Africa, that was the order that they had that they used. And uh, Cyprian, uh, sometimes, not not as much as some other folks, but but sometimes would uh, interpret passages look, looking for a way in which you can apply it on an, 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 an uh, let's say, allegorical method. Uh, that's not quite the right term. An an anagogical, I think, would, would be an another one, but that, nobody knows what that means anymore. But um, but the idea is that they're looking for a spiritual way in which John says something like a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What do these What do these three things represent? The the water, the blood, and the spirit. When, when you're looking at a Latin text that has them in that order, think about it hard enough, and you can squint into existence an interpretation that says, well, the water represents the Father, because he says in the Old Testament, now, I am the living waters, back in Jeremiah and Isaiah, I am the I am the fountain, come ye to the waters, you got Isaiah 55 there, and also passages in, in, in Jeremiah where I am I, the waters, and uh, then you have the blood, obviously, you know, which member of the, of the Godhead has the, 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 when we think of the blood, obviously Christ, the Son, and then of course for spirit, well it's practically automatic, this is the spirit. So, uh, if you would interpret that allegorically, um, you can easily see how that reference to what we know as verse 8 would be interpreted as a reference to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you look at the early commentaries, and I, I mentioned one in, in the materials I've already referenced, uh, by an anonymous uh, Irish commentator, uh, he uh, has his commentary, and he's probably not making it up on the spot, but, but but using other sources like a lot of commentators do, and it's, and he's he doesn't have the uh, common Johannium in his in the text that he's quoting, but he has this interpretation of what we know as verse eight. So Cyprian could very well be making this kind of interpretation of verse eight or again what we know of as what we know as verse eight, but without the common Johannium in the text, the uh, the Irish uh, Hibernian uh, commentator does it without C J. And so there's no reason to think that Cyprian wasn't also making the same kind of 
allegorical interpretation of the water, the blood, and the spirit. Because in his text, that's the order they were found in, and that's why the connection would be, would be brought to mind. In the Greek text, where you have, in order to say, a different order, you don't have the connection the, of the Trinity brought to mind there because they, they don't appear in the same order. And that's why you don't have much of the CJ in the Greek text, because there was nothing there to, to elicit it in the mind of the interpreter. But in the old Latin text of North Africa, you did, and that's why you see it in the Latin, but not in the Greek, because it's an, interpret it, it's an interpretation. It has its source as an interpretation of what we know as verse 8, with the, with the terms being inverted or, or transposed, you could say. As for the others, uh, you mentioned that Jerome quotes the comma Johannium. Uh, no, uh, usually what you're quoting when you say, when you think you're quoting the Jerome is you're quoting the uh, preface to the canonical epistles as it's found in Codex Faldensis. Now, this is a source that most people in the past have assumed to be uh, by Jerome, but when you look at its text, you see that it's quoting from the old Latin text, and it too has the inversion, the transposition of, of the terms. And we don't need to wonder about this because he, he has the, that, that part is, is quoted right there in the text of the preface to the canonical epistles. So that's somebody who is favoring and using that old Latin text. And the person who's, who people have said, like, like one of your sources, have assumed to be Jerome is advocating for the text with that transposition. So um, that's one okay. reason that's not really thought to be Jerome, but somebody pretending to be Jerome. Still somebody pretty early, still still a source in the 400s, so uh, not not to be just pushed aside casually. But uh, but when they say that that's definitely Jerome, uh, I, w I would say there's a case to be made against that. Um, so I, you mentioned some, some, other, some other sources that yeah. you mentioned. I, I think I dealt with the Council of Carthage, and, uh, and again, that's readily accepted, but it's accepted as just an, an echo of the old Latin text that was used in North Africa. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so let's go back to Tertullian for a second. Um, I pulled up the early church fathers, um, and I'm, I'm looking at Tertullian's quote, and then there's an explanation for his quote um, by Schaff in volume three, um, where Tertullian is quoted here with 1 John 5, 7. And I want to read what the quote is, and then I want to read what the explanation is after that and see what your thoughts are. So, let's see, he says, uh, did a Latin version exist in his day, or does he translate from the Greek of the New Testament and the Septuagint? A paradoxical writer, Semler, contends that Tertullian never used a Greek manuscript, but Tertullian's rugged Latin betrays there is no reason to doubt that he knew the Greek scriptures primarily, if he knew any Greek whatever. Possibly we owe to Tertullian the primordia of the old African Latin versions, some of which seem to have contained the disputed text, 1 John 5, 7, of which more when we come to the praxis for the present in the absence of definite evidence, we must infer that Tertullian used, uh, Tertullian usually translated from the Septuagint and from the originals of the New Testament. But Mosheim, I think I'm maybe pronouncing that wrong, thinks that the progress of the gospel in the West was now facilitated by the existence of Latin versions. Observe also Kay's important note. Uh, but then I want to see the explanation about this, where he says, uh, let's see here. It appears to me very clear that Tertullian is quoting 1 John 5, 7 in the passage, now under consideration. And it's in Latin. I'm not going to read it because I'll sound like a dummy. But... It, he says, let me refer to a work containing a sufficient answer to Porson on this point of Tertullian's quotation, which it is easier to pass sub silentio than to refute. I mean, Forster's new plea, of which the full title is placed in the margin. The whole work is worth thoughtful study, but I name it in the reference to this important passage of our author exclusively. In connection with the other considerations, of which I have no right to enlarge in this place, it satisfies me as to the primitive origin of the text of the Vulgate, in the Vulgate, and hence of its right to stand in our English Vulgate until it can be shown that the Septuagint version quoted and honored by the Lord is free from similar readings and divergences from the Hebrew. So, where was it? That's, um... Uh, if, you, if you go to uh, Roger Pierce's Tertullian site, you should be able to find his the details of his quotation pretty easily, both in English and in Latin. 
Okay. And if you just simply uh, line them up. You, you'll be able to see that um, the CJ is not really an ex and and built in part of his quotation. He's quoting. No, if he's quoting from First John five seven, it's just that one phrase: the three are one. Um, you understand what I'm saying? That, that yeah, I understand what you're saying. Because the, the the forester, we're talking something back in the 1800s. It, it's not like people have not already taken this into consideration. Yeah. See, I was reading something earlier that said that it it had the three witnesses from Tertullian in the margin. I don't know where I read that. And and then he went on to say. Whether it's in the margin or not, I find it. He thought that it was genuine, but anyways. So you're you're saying that either way, it doesn't really matter one way or the other because it's an 18th century note. Is that right? Well, no, I'm I'm, I'm saying that For, For, Forster, the 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 guy, the, the source that you're you're talking about there. Uh, th there was a long discussion with lots of papers being written and a series of letters that were sent out and. Then vociferous replies were written back, and even more vociferous replies to those replies were written back. Uh, there was also an involvement with a guy named uh, Gibbon, who was uh, not not the most uh, devout uh, mind of his time, and um, he saw it all as some vast conspiracy of the church to promote this verse. And to him, it was this big battleground. And now, of course, guys, you have other other people too that would say, well, it, it if if what you're saying is true and the church was able to establish the doctrine of the Trinity without this verse, then it's not really a big battleground. And uh, some, some have said that, uh, no, you, you, you probably heard, you heard yourself people say there are, there are no doctrinally important textual variants, but then you have this one right here, and uh, then, you, then you have to kind of read the fine print. And if you look at guys like uh, Daniel Wallace, when, they, when you say, are there any textual variants that affect doctrine? And... Obviously, the common you hand when we come to the t list of the top contenders for that title, um, you, you say, well, in terms of what is plausible, uh, but uh, but uh, no, again, I'm just saying what people would say. Uh, they would qualify it to say it has to be both plausible and and viable. It has to be a, a chance that it could be the original text. And when it comes to the common Johannian, because its text base is so poor, because it's so poorly attested in the Greek manuscript, they would say, well, there's simply there's simply no plausible way you can make an argument that this would be a genuine part of the Greek text written by John. Everything about the evidence points to an origin in the old Latin text as it was used in North Africa. Yeah, so, but what do you, what do you, I mean, because you do find a number, let's just look at the numbers for the old Latin and, and see what your thoughts are on that, because um, what, what I was saying, what I was reading was, was showing that there's over 8,000 Latin Vulgate manuscripts. Over 98% of them contain 1 John 5, 7. So, um, okay, okay. Uh, time, out, time out there for a second. Yeah. Uh, um, when it's, to treat the Vulgate in a monolithic way is an oversimplification. The, the Vulgate didn't just drop from Jerome's hands into our laps. Uh, it was, it went, as, as the Vulgate was, was disseminated, um, it hit, the, the Latin that was already in place, and there was, and, and the old Latin has it had its fans. Uh, you can find some some Vulgate manuscripts which will still have the old Latin notes and old Latin uh, divisions and, uh, and old Latin even even some uh, old Latin uh, book orders. Uh, so it's not like the Vulgate started and the old Latin stopped. For a time there, they were there was a a fight. Also, later on, you have the, the Vulgate being revised in the days of, of Charlemagne. Uh, Alcuin, uh, Charlemagne, you know, the, big, the, the scholar guy, um, he made a revision of the Vulgate. Also, as the, uh, later on, there was a kind of a standardization when they, they got a, not, not exactly a, a factory pr produced uh, kind of Vulgate in, in Paris, but you can look at lots of handmade copies of the Vulgate that are very, very similar to each other. Based based from Paris, based from the same, uh, basically copyist using the same man, same manuscript base, and obviously if you get that many branches on the same tree, you can get thousands of, of, of fruit. But once you realize it's all from the same tree, excuse me, it's all it's all from the same branch. Uh, well, well, there you go. There's, there's, there might be hundreds of copies from a single copying house in Paris. But they're all just echoes of the sources that they're using. But if that's you, true, you're trying to, try to go beyond that source. 
if that's true, then then what you're saying is 98% of the old Latin is actually from one branch, which would seem to have more weight to it to me. No, no, no. I know. I'm saying that when it comes to the Vulgate, a lot of oh. the later Vulgate copies, like like a Bergen, Bergen in, in um, somewhere along the line, Bergen, Bergen observes that you know, 49 out of 50 copies of the Vulgate will have the the common Johannian, Yeah. Which uh, I don't know if anybody's ever tested that theory, but but it, it doesn't. It, it seems reasonable. Um, not that everything reasonable is is true. But, uh, but I won't ch challenge the, the statistics. But regardless but of the Vulgate... To, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go back to Codex, Codex Valdensis, and you won't see the CJ. But but that still, that could fall within the 2%. But I, I guess my reference, it, regardless of the Vulgate, what do you think about that quote on the Old Latin, that there's, there's uh, 8,000 of them with 98% of them containing that? I'd say we... Can you give that exact quote, please? It says, in addition to the Old Latin, the Latin Vulgate has 1 John 5, 7. Yeah, that would be... Okay. While Jerome's Vulgate okay, so did not contain... To, do what? So you're saying, in, in addition to the Old Latin? Yes. You're not talking about 8,000 Old Latin copies. You're talking right, about right. Vulgate copies, like, 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 like Paris factory copies. But you're, you're specifically referencing the Latin Vulgate, not the Old Latin, when you're when you're making the one branch comparison there, is that right? Yes. Okay. As, as, as far as where it originated, I'm saying that when the, when the Vulgate was produced, it didn't have the, the CJ. But okay. the CJ was, 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 became very popular in Carthage, it became very popular in North Africa, and when you have these theological discussions in the 300s and 400s, and it becomes, well, are you Orthodox? It, you know, we, we we know we're Orthodox. You you because in in North Africa there there, there were wars being fought between the Arians and yeah. the Orthodox. Uh, the 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 Vandals were basically Arian. Um, I mean, it, and not not that you could sit down and have a theological discussion with your typical Vandal, but but <laughs> they they were with not only uh, ethnically different, but they were theologically different, and this was part of their identity. And this this fight in Africa continued. All the way up to the time of Justinian, uh, where there was this uh, back and forth until finally Belisarius uh, took care of business in North Africa. But, uh, but, but, but when the question came out, is this phrase original, by that time, uh, in that part of the world, uh, people weren't looking to see what it said in the Greek manuscripts anymore. They looked at what it said in the Latin manuscripts. And in the Latin manuscripts, they had this verse, and it was, became very popular, Cassiodorus. Uh, qu quotes it, and you and but but the thing to see is that if you follow along the Latin text of First John and the verse that we know of as verse eight in, in First John five seven and First John, John five eight, follow along the comma Johannium, but also look for that transposition in what we know as uh, know of know as verse eight, and you'll see that the comma Johannium follows the transposition. Um, so you mentioned the Orthodox. What do you think about the Greek Orthodox? Why have they always included First John five seven, and considered it authentic at least? I think the short answer is because of tradition. For the same reason they they uh, subscribe to the uh, the Septuagint, because for the same reason they have the the odes in, in, in the into the Book of Psalms and and. and one word tradition. So if it's from tradition, it's then the traditionally Orthodox. they would. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I have a tendency okay. to do that. Okay. You, you could probably say that in the in the Orthodox tradition, and uh, if there's any Orthodox people out there that want to to, uh, to fine tune this, uh, feel free to chime in, in the comments eventually. But uh, you probably say that the tradition of the Church is regarded as a, a a vessel, and the text is being carried along, and just as we when when we look at the say the the, the books of Moses, you know, here here and there it'll say at that time there was no king. And and a, a very conservative person might say, well, well, Moses was looking ahead hundreds of years and predicting that there was he was seeing that someday a reader would say there was no king. Others would say, well, what you've got here is a redactor, somebody who is the the guardian of Moses's books, but he's making this observation, and that's what we have in our text. And we're not going to go through the trouble of of a. Uh, trying to wash the redactor's work off of Moses' work because we might actually wash off some of Moses' work. So we're going to keep it all together and hand it down 
as is. And as is, uh, it is what we've been been, been given. Now, uh, you could say that's a very good case for the uh, tradition of the majority text. In the case of the Kama Yohannium, uh, if you look at the actual printed text that was from 1904, 1912, the, the, the uh, patriarchal text, um, they do something weird there with the comma. So I would say that it's not a settled question, even, even regarding the question of, uh, e even with the tradition as part of the equation. Yeah. Well, and I don't, I don't doubt that there's any, it, it, there's no question that this is the most debated passage in the whole Bible. Um, so we've talked about the Orthodox Church. We've talked about a little bit of what Dean Bergen wrote. We've talked about, um, what do you think about that reference word, um, let me see if I've got my note here. I want to get your take on it. George Travis is said to have documented 31 Greek manuscripts that bore witness to 1 John 5, 7 in his letters to Edward George Gibbon. What do you think about that? That came out a little bit garbled, but I okay. think I know what you mean. I think he's got his manuscripts mixed up. I think he has accidentally doubled up two lists, or at least, at least two lists, maybe more, but at least two lists where the same manuscripts are being referenced. And he just doesn't know what he's doing well enough to rec to realize that he's describing one manuscript and then is actually then is taking another list of the same manuscripts, but they're a little bit different, and he doesn't realize what's going on in his sources, and so out pops extra manuscripts, which if you look into it, it doesn't really exist. Uh, Calvin did something similar. Okay, now kind of going back to the old Latin. What, uh, tell me what you think about this quote, because I read it earlier. I read a lot. It was basically just to throw the information out there and see what stuck to the wall um, kind of a thing, and then we can talk about it um, and and see how long, how much time we want to spend on First John 5-7. But the quote was this, most scholars agreed that the old Latin New Testament was translated from the Greek around the second half of the second century, some even before that. The time range is from 137 AD to 150 AD. So soon after the Bible was completed, the Greek scriptures were translated into Latin. Copies of the Old Latin we have today are from the 6th century to the 13th, and there are copies that go back as far as the 2nd century. But then we've got the six Old Main Latin, uh, the main Old Latin copies that contain 1 John 5, 7, and I think that you said there was even seven, one of them that I didn't include in that list. But what are your thoughts about that? What's the credibility to that? When it comes to when the Old Latin was was, was first initially translated, um, I, I'd say mid-100s is a pretty good early early, early date, uh, maybe late late 100s for, 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 for that late, later date. But the thing to realize is it's not as if they just made it and stamped it in stone and the next guy just made an exact copy. Um, there were Western copyists, and when I say Western, I mean ba basically uh, like the old Latin, but, but people who were willing to, to tweak the text so that people would do would understand it better. Um, people who, if they were reading a passage and they said, wait a minute, wait a minute I, I'm getting my characters mixed up. Who was, that, that was Jesus talking. So the other one was Peter? Yeah, that was Peter. Well, can we put their names in there so we don't get them mixed up? Okay, let's do that. They, they were willing to bring out the meaning of the text yeah. uh, by, by altering. They, they, they valued the meaning of it more than the exact form because after all, they're not using the exact form. They're in Latin now. They they left the exact form and they left the Greek. So yeah. when when the last trans so you not only have the translation being made, but you also have copyists and scribes who want to bring out its meaning. And to bring out its meaning, some of them were, were quite willing to add in what was called what what were called uh, glosses. That's basically what we have in the case of the Common Johannian. But um, so now don't take this the wrong way. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to come at you at the wrong angle here. Um, but this is. You asked me earlier um, when I was. I was given some of those quotes about the statistics that I'd given, and uh, we dove a little bit deeper. I didn't have much of an answer. I just said, "Hey, you know, I'm just going off of what these guys are writing as as proof that it is in uh, the Library of Constantinople. I haven't been there to look at it. But what kind of evidence do you have that that actually happened?" in 1 John 5, 7, in the Old Latin. I mean, what are you looking at to come to a conclusion like that in this particular passage? Okay, well, first I would start by, by saying John wrote 1 John in Greek. When we look at the uh, vast majority of Greek manuscripts of 1 John, we don't see the CJ. It's just not there. We see uh, a perfectly sensible sentence. Uh, some have tried to say that there's grammatical differences that make, make it require the CJ, which is just 
not true. Again, go to the essays. There's one that's specially focused on that on that, on that part of the subject. But when we look at the Greek text, uh, we do what Jerome encourages us to do: go back to the sources, go back to the Greek, and uh, we look at the Greek manuscripts. Now, in the case of First John, um, we can't appeal to so 5,000 Greek manuscripts because we don't have 5,000 Greek right. manuscripts. First John, it's slow, lower number. Yeah, I and, think um, they said there was 500. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it, it's much lower than 5,000 certainly. But uh, but if you look look at the the manuscripts we do have, and just sort through them, you'll notice that in the manuscripts that have the CJ, it's almost always because there's a Latin source right beside it. And you have a Greek text that's been influenced by the Latin text. In other words, somebody has t made a bilingual manuscript. Uh, 629 is a great example of this. And uh, it's been digitized. It's online. It's at the Vatican. You can find it. You can go there. Uh, again, there are links in the essay. If you look at 629, you'll see Latin here, Greek here, and kind of a telltale sign of being translated from Latin into Greek is is when it, where it comes to the, the articles. Uh, Latin is different from Greek. Doesn't have doesn't have the articles. That the, 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 doesn't doesn't treat that aspect of language the same way. And so when you find a text of the CJ without the articles, um, it's a it's a telltale sign. It's it's it's, it's a fingerprint of the crime scene uh, that shows that it's been been rendered from the Latin to make the two texts line up. Uh, likewise, it, in, in some Armenian manuscripts, we have the same thing in different passages where where you have Armenian here and you have Latin here and the the Armenian text has been conformed to to fit the Latin. So in those manuscripts that, that have it, uh, look for the telltale signs. Look 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 at the text as it appears in the TR, the text that, that Erasmus made, and look at the text as it appears in the manuscript, and I think you'll see uh, discernible differences if you take the time and go through. Uh, there's only like eight manuscripts that, that have the CJ. Look at those examples. In, in, in the text, I mean, not, not, not written no, hundreds of years later in the margin. But look at the, those those manuscripts text of the CJ. Look, look at the fine details, and I think it will become more and more obvious. This has been translated from Latin into Greek. Somebody got this from Latin into Greek. That's why those articles are there. That's, that's, why, that's why these aspects of the text are different. Uh, so, so it's real easy to stare from a vast distance and look over that hill over there and say, Oh, Cyprian. Oh, Jerome. Oh, these these old Latin manuscripts, but when you get them up close and you start looking at them up close, it's easy to see this was never a Greek text until somebody translated it from Latin into Greek and put it in the Greek text, which is what happened in the case of the manuscript that that Erasmus accepted, which is why it ended up in the King James version and the Geneva version, all of all of versions pretty much in English and in, in the Reformation period because because of what happened with with Erasmus. Uh, Erasmus said. Uh, Issued his first and second uh, volumes uh, editions with, without the uh, the Comma Johannium, and um, uh, another scholar, Mr. Lee, had a uh, criticized him for this. Said, hey, wait a minute, well, if we go around using a text without without these verses, surely we're going to look like Arian. You know, you you you're starting to kind of look like an Arian. And Erasmus said, "I am not an Arian." And Lee was like, "No, obviously, I'm <laughs> paraphrasing here, so." So don't go making up a story about about a rash promise, but uh, but Lee basically prodded Erasmus to say, "Prove your orthodoxy. How how do we know that you weren't negligent and you had the, you had this in the manuscript and you just didn't put it in?" And Erasmus said, "I didn't have it in any of my Greek manuscripts. It just wasn't there. If I had had one Greek manuscript, you believe me, I would have put it in there." Okay, time out from there. Fast forward a couple of months. Somebody from Great Britain says, "Guess what?" Lo and behold, we have a Greek manuscript that has that passage in the text, and they presented it. And Erasmus says, "says Well, well, there you go. It's it, it's there." I uh, he didn't promise. I, no, 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 you know, Metzger made the Metzger was just echoing his sources. People that had written stuff, and he was reading it off. And um, that can that can be a. a uh, uh, not a good method. Okay, but, so uh, I've got a couple of things on that to transition, um, and this could be our final point if you want to end it on um, on First John five seven and then move on. Um, that's up to you. But um, so now, obviously, you, Peter Gurry, and Jeff Riddle are going to have uh, kind of a roundtable discussion on the 29th, which I'm really looking forward to. Was it the twenty? I think it was the 29th, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and I, this is this is the kind of conversation that I am hoping is kind of the direction that it w it'll be able to go. Um, specifically with Erasmus um, and the rash wager with Lee saying, you know, that he had the manuscript that he needed, that Erasmus had said, well, do what? There was never any such wager. But isn't it? I mean, so what are you? What are you? You're saying it's there was never a wager, but that um, there was Erasmus never, a wager. never ever 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 ever. But didn't didn't never. you just say that? And maybe I misheard you. And I was trying to look it up. Um, but did you? What were you saying about um, Erasmus saying that he didn't have any um, Greek support for it to be in the text, and if anyone brought him a manuscript that had it, that he would put it in there, and then Lee came to it and brought it to him. Oh, he he, he, he never said he would put it in there. He put himself in a tough situation where he had said, if I had it in one man, in one manuscript, I would have put it in there, but I didn't. And that's why I didn't do it, because I couldn't do it, because it wasn't in my manuscripts. If I okay. had one, I would have done it, but I, I didn't. <laughs> so what happens, though, when he comes time to make the next edition, and they say, hey, remember when you said if you had one manuscript, you would have We've got it. it. Well, okay. Here you go. I see. So he was just in a hard situation, and he, he could have said, oh, I refuse, I, I was just speaking rashly back then, Yeah. but I, I refuse to put it in now. Look at, well, well, obviously, Lee and other critics of him would have said, ah, you see, you were being dishonest back then when you said you would put it in, because now you have one, and you're not putting it in. So yeah. that's what could see that he would lose a propaganda battle if he but didn't put it in. But why are you saying that's not a, a wager? Because he never promised, I will put it in. He's, all, all he said was, oh, I if see. I had had it, I would have put it in. Okay. Which is not the same as saying, no. <clears throat> so if Jeff, I have one, put it in. Uh, Jeff Riddle has on his his website, jeffriddle.net, he has an actual article called um, Erasmus Anecdotes. And in Word, Word Magazine number 46, he he actually does, in his podcast on there, he, he talks about this. But there was an article by Ryan M. Reeves that was posted in February of 2016 on the Reformation 21 blog, um, specifically about this particular um, point that, that's being made, and he says none of that ever happened. <laughs> so maybe if you guys get a chance to talk, um, that would be pretty sweet to hear you guys no, iron I'm, that I'm, out. I'm, I'm very confident that basically he is saying what Hink, Hink Jiang, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but if you look for uh, Hink, that's H E N K, uh, De Jong, D E yep. J, and just go on from there. Uh, Google, just write H E N K, come your handy, and it will probably appear. Uh, well, there will be a downloadable file about Erasmus and how the whole tall tale about the promise started you know, more than a century ago. Because uh, guys were telling that story back in the 1800s. And Metzger was just telling him, t telling his his readers what had been handed down to him, but nobody had ever actually looked up what had happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, I still think that it's genuine and it should be in there, James. Well, uh, well, there's uh, one, one, one more point uh, worth <laughs> with, uh, looking into when it comes to the uh, Reformation treatment of the Coming of Hanningham. First, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Erasmus's first two editions didn't have it. He put it in there after he kind of got himself stuck in a hard place with, as far as what people could have said if he didn't have put it in. So he hadn't made a promise, but he was in a very difficult position where he probably felt obligated to put it in. By, more, more by circumstances than by yeah. explicit promise. So, but, uh, but later on, when St Stephanus uh, printed the apparatus to the Greek New Testament, um, okay. Um, I might put a link, and this caused more problems. Oh, I'm sorry. There was okay. a there was a little bit of lag there. I, I I think I cut you off. I wasn't looking at the screen. What was the last part of that? Oh, I said I said besides the difficulties that Erasmus had, there was also a problem with uh, one of Stephanus's uh, editions. I think either the 1550 or 1551, or maybe both. But um, in his apparatus, there was a a symbol, kind of like a comma. Where he's listing witnesses, and and again, uh, at, at the blog and other resources online, if the if you can track down snapshots of that page, you can you can see that um, Stephanus basically was trying to say one thing, but ended up after the printer got through with it, saying another thing about how many manuscripts had or did not have a particular uh, reading uh, in in the verse. 
and it made it look to people like if you would if you didn't know that it was a typographical uh, not not really typographical but but a printing error if you didn't know it was a printing error you would naturally deduce that the whole comma Johannium must be in those manuscripts but um and, and Calvin, a couple of years later, probably reading the probably re reading that the same apparatus that all, all his colleagues had, and and again and again, I wasn't looking over Calvin's shoulder to know that he was reading Stephanus's apparatus, but Calvin, in one of his uh, notes on the on, on the Common Johannium, says, "Well, we have this evidence that all the all the good manuscripts have it." Uh, of which that effect? Uh, again, go to the materials, and you can see the exact quote. But um, Calvin seems to have been laboring under the uh, misimpression that uh, a lot of manuscripts had this verse, whereas actually, if you look at what Stephanus was really trying to say, it was, no, they don't have these verses. Only, only this one, 61, uh, only this one, comma, number 61, has it. So, um, so when, when it comes to uh, sorting out what were people saying about it after the 1550s, one of the things to bear in mind is, did this person depend on Stephanus and thus probably likely have a completely back, completely backwards impression of what manuscripts had it and did not have it? If we conclude, well, yes, those folks did have their misimpression because they were misled by, it, by a printing error, then what should we do? Should we go on pretending that we also have to be misled by a printing error, or should we rewind things and reconsider the evidence? Okay, I want to see what you think about this quote, and then we can move on. <laughs> okay, now, um, I'm sure that you have an opinion, F. Hill's book, on uh, text and time, or the king. I'm sure that, I, I don't know what the deal is, I don't, maybe my gain isn't up enough, it's, it's up there pretty good, but. Okay, so, now, in, in Edward F. Hill's book, Text and Time, or uh, King James Version Defended, he has some notes on Erasmus in particular, and he says this in point E. I'm not sure what chapter it is, but I'm not going to look it up. So it says this, his, his knowledge of variant readings and critical problems is, is the subheading where he says, through a study of the writings of Jerome and other church fathers, Erasmus became very well informed concerning the variant readings of the New Testament text. Indeed, almost all the important variant readings known to scholars today were already known to Erasmus more than 460 years ago and discussed in the notes, which previ previously appeared, where he placed after the text in his editions of the Greek New Testament. Here, for example, Erasmus dealt with such problem passages as the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.13, the interview of the rich young man with Jesus in 19.17-22, the ending of Mark, the angelic song in Luke 2, the angel, agony and blood sweat omitted in Luke 22, 43 and 44. And then you've got the woman taking adultery and even the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3, 16. But he goes on to say this, and then I'll get your take and then we can move on or um, shut it down for the night. It's up to you, but it says this. In his notes, Erasmus placed before the reader not only ancient discussions concerning the New Testament text, but also debates which took place in the early church over the New Testament canon, and the authorship of some of the New Testament books, especially Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Not only did he mention the doubts reported by Jerome and the early church fathers, but also added some objections of his own. However, he discussed these matters somewhat warily, declaring himself willing at any time to submit to the consensus of the public opinion, and especially to the authority of the church. In short, he seemed to recognize that in the reopening of the question of the New Testament canon, he was going contrary to the common faith, but he was cautious in his notes, and it goes on, um, but anyways, I want to see what you thought about that, Is is because some people say that Erasmus would, you know, if, if he had the Greek manuscript, he'd put it in, not specifically with 1 John 5, 7, but anything, if there was a Greek manuscript for it, he'd put it in there. What are your thoughts on kind of the scholarship of Erasmus, and, and how much how much study he actually put into what was contested, what wasn't contested, what the common debates were. Was he really up to speed on whether or not um, that was kind of a contested thing that really should or shouldn't go in there? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the the, the broader question, what, what Hill's really talking about, the question of canon, um, that's not really germane to the question of the, of the, of the common Johannium. But uh, Jerome's scholarship is often... Under, underestimated, I would say sometimes even in, intentionally minimized, 
um, sometimes you'll you'll ask uh, people who are trying to promote their own translation or a translation they were involved in, say uh, the NIV or the NET, and say, how how did Erasmus do? Was he was he a good scholar? And they'll say, well, he was okay for his time, but of course nowadays we have this much vaster materials, and Erasmus he would be overwhelmed if he would he would invite <laughs> the materials that we have. I have no idea who you're talking oh, about. Erasmus stay in there in Basel with just a handful of manuscripts, while he would jump at the chance to study Vaticanus and all the manuscripts that we have today. That's right. Um, and and so he would have he, laughed he, he, at you. <laughs> you know, may, maybe maybe some folks want to downplay how good Erasmus was as a scholar because they they have their own books to sell. But uh, but Erasmus' scholarship was excellent. And Erasmus spent his whole life, previous to the time when he did his translation work, he was a, he was a scholar, um, a scholar, scholar. And uh, we talk about yeah, he might not have as many manuscripts, but uh, you could probably whittle, whittle, whittle down the number of manuscripts used in in, in the Nestle, Nestle Island. If you probably had forty five manuscripts, you could probably reconstruct the Nestle Island text from those forty five manuscripts except for those parts where they, they're not basing it on any manuscript. You mean like, so, uh, what is it? Second Peter 3.10 yep, yep. and Acts 16.12. Yeah, yeah, you can't talk about yeah, that, yeah, James. Things like that. But, but not, not to get too far away from the subject, though, Erasmus' scholarship was excellent. People did describe uh, these, these textual variants back in those days. Uh, before Erasmus, uh, Vala, um, whose works Erasmus published was kind of, kind of, Lit the fuse, so to speak. Uh, no, no Vala, no Erasmus. So really, uh, Vala is should should be in the picture too. We shouldn't minimize his work, um, which which also caused some problems for the donations of Constantine and some other things. But that's another story. But Erasmus uh, did a whole lot of, of work with patristic writings, and was very familiar with with their quotations of scripture. So it's like, yeah, he didn't have manuscripts, but he had quotations from manuscripts that are older than any manuscript we have today. That's got to count for something. Yeah. So I think that Erasmus's materials are sometimes being downplayed with a, without a, a, a proper recognition of of a, the the scope of materials that he did have, because he made good use of what he did have. There are other guys too, um, just, just uh, Zegers, to name just one. Uh, Zegers was a Roman Catholic scholar, and at the time of Stephanus, uh, Zegers is doing the same sort of thing, writing writing about textual variants. And so Erasmus wasn't the only one. Uh, these things were in play, and and the questions were being discussed. And uh, Erasmus was a first-rate scholar. Okay, I'm going to ask a difficult question. It's kind of uh, it's kind of off the wall. It's it, it may be a little bit silly, but um, what do you think about some people who would say, you know, you cannot prove that the comma was in the original autograph. You know, obviously you can't prove it was in the original. But what do you say to anybody who says you can't prove that anything was in the original autograph? And kind of put those two comparisons side by side and say, well, you know, you, you can't prove really that anything was in the original autograph because obviously we don't have the original autograph. So I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to get at is, um, what, are, what are we trying to get at when we're having conversations like this? Or is, do you think it's profitable? Is it something that needs to be talked about and and where should people go with this in this conversation I, I think the term moral certitude uh, has a part in the in the, in, the, in the conversation uh, when it says when, when people ask well how can you prove this uh, how can you prove that um, well you have to consider the evidence now at some point uh, evidence will give way um, uh, the old the old question about uh, Lao La, La, La Xu, I you know the, the guy that woke up from a dream and so I just haven't had a fantastic dream that I was I was I was a butterfly. <laughs> I, I I flew like a butterfly. I tasted <laughs> flowers like a butterfly. How do I know now that I'm not just a butterfly having a fantastic dream? Well, how can you prove that? <laughs> how can I prove that I'm not a butterfly having a really fantastic, very long dream? Uh, well, you can't technically, depending yeah. on what level of empirical. Uh, evidence you you want to muster, but you do have what's called the elegance of the argument when it comes to the comma Johannium. When it comes to the CJ, um, look at that transposition in the old Latin text. 
and look at where you see the comma Johannium to originate, and then eventually in the Latin text begin to dominate. And you'll see, for instance, in just just go down the list of where is the comma used and where is it quoted. If they quote it for any extent, you'll you'll see the three witnesses at the other end of the quotation too, and you'll see the transposition. Uh, it's not always exact, but when it is exact, like for instance, the look, look at Cass, Cass, Cassiodorus, uh, another great scholar, but uh, he's using a text that's been handed down to him that has the the Comiohanium in it, and it has also has the transposition. When you see the gloss follow the transposition, it's because it came from the transposition. No transposition, no gloss. So again, look in the Greek text. No transposition in there in verse 8. That's why you don't have the comma there in verse 7, because the comma was initiated by the transposition. Okay, but my question is still, why why, did, why is it in the Old Latin that precedes the transposition, if we're saying that it didn't start until the transposition? No, no I'm saying that the, the, the transposition started in the Old Latin, and only in the Old Latin. That's why we don't see... But we're saying that it came that the Old Latin came from the Greek. The, the Old Latin came from the Greek, but at some point they were transposed. Transpositions happen all the time in the Old Latin. But if, if it was if, transposed... If you, how, how, how familiar mm. are you with, with the, the Old Latin translation in, in general? Um, just, I mean, as much as I can read someone and trust them. <laughs> well, uh, 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 the, the, uh, recently, uh, Hugh, Hugh Houghton, uh, I'm probably not pronouncing his name right, but uh, Hugh uh, put out a book called the, the Latin New Testament. Okay. And... If you look through his book, he will he, he, he has a list there of, of uh, the most important old Latin manuscripts. Many of them are not purely old Latin. A lot of them will be old Latin over here and Vulgate over here. Some some of them will have you no know, just this 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 one book will be old Latin and, and the other books around it will be will be Vulgate. Some of them are mixed though, where where it's it's like somebody really did have a Vulgate copy here and a, an old Latin copy here and I was just kind of picking and choosing what they liked, and and manuscripts like that, which are, which are not block mix, but just have have pure mixture in between. Uh, that that's where you you, you see you know, you'll, you'll have something from here and something from here, and you can get really 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 uh, it, it's hard it's hard to see the the exact history of the text at that point. Yeah. But when you see a gloss come up, and you see that it is connected to another reading, when these readings pair up, like the transposition pairs up with the Kamiyanium, you see that they, they go together because one was one from the other one. Okay. Well, now that makes sense. It sounds a little complicated and like I'd have to do a lot of reading to get just as much as what you presented just now. So I've got my work cut out for me and I appreciate that. What I do want to say um, is this. You mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, you mentioned it last night as well, but just for the sake of our listeners who may not have heard it, where can they find what you have done on First John five seven? There are several places. Uh, Academia, uh, the website where people can upload papers to, uh, it's there. You have to sign up and become a member, but it's free. And uh, also at the uh, Facebook group called NT Textual Criticism. If you sign up and become a member there, just go to the files. There's lots of files there. One of them is called you know, Five Essays on the Comma Johannium. Just download that. Again, it's free. Also, if you're a little iffy about how much you want this time you want to spend on Facebook, if you think you might be being, if, if, if it's free, maybe you're the product, there's another website called MeWe, which is kind of the anti-censorship form of Facebook. There, of course, it's an independent country, co company as far as I know. But on MeWe, there's also a group called NT Textual Criticism, which, which I've made there. And at MeWe, in the NT Textual Criticism site, once you join and become a member, it's, it's, it's free. Uh, you will have access to over 200 files of, that I've written on various New Testament textual criti criticism topics. And this is one of those topics. So again, you can find the files uh, right there on MeWe. Okay, that's good. Um, let's see. It's about 10.30 right now. Would you like to start another variant, or do you want to shut it down and see if we can do it in a third part? I'm fine if you're fine. Okay. 
I'll go about, I can go about another 20 minutes. I've got to get up at four in the morning. So it's, it'll come early for me. So let's do, you think we can, which one do you want to do in 20 minutes? Uh, in 20 minutes? Uh, oh, you, you go ahead and pick. Let's do, oh, this will be a fun one. How about Mark 1-2? Okay. Uh, Mark 1-2, um, Gordon Fee, uh, uh, is a scholar who wrote a commentary a while back and uh, and also wrote some some articles. Uh, at one point, anyway, getting to the point, he wrote that uh, Mark 1, 2, the evidence for Mark 1, 2 reading in Isaiah the prophet instead of in the prophets is a spectacular, strong example of the strength of the eclectic text and is a strong, obvious, clear as day reason why we shouldn't follow the Byzantine text because... All the Byzantine manuscripts, they talk about, no, in the prophets. Well, in the Latin text and in you know, the old Greek manuscripts, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, no, the good ones, it says, no, in Isaiah the prophet. And so Fee's basic idea was it's, it's, it's really clear. This is a spectacular case of the superiority of the, the old Alexandrian text base. Well... Um, Morris Robinson said not so fast there, and I also would say not so fast there because there's a good case for in the prophets. Uh, if you look at the scribal habits that that, that copyists had back back when be, before the Byzantine text dominated, um, there were tendencies to do what people do sometimes in some of the new paraphrases, which is to specify a, 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 a non-specific passage. Um, just the same way as sometimes copyists would, would put in Jesus' name where there was originally only a pronoun. Uh, here in Mark chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, in the prophets, well, that, that elicits an obvious question in the mind of some readers, which is, well, which prophet is it? Tell me. So somebody says, well, it's, it's Isaiah. Now, whether it is Isaiah or not is another question, but you can see why they want to answer the question, why the reading in the prophets poses a difficulty, because people are going to want to know exactly where, though. Why, does, why isn't Mark more exact? Can't, I mean, he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Can't he, can't he tell us exactly which prophet he's talking about? And um, so some, somebody at some point wrote down, no, in, in Isaiah the prophet. So the catch is, if you look in Isaiah, uh, it doesn't say exactly what it says there in Mark 1. You could, you, could, you could say, well, part of it's Isaiah, but it sure does look like it starts out there with Malachi. And uh, others would say, it's not Malachi or Isaiah. It's, it's, it's in Exodus. And if you uh, go through the manuscripts and look uh, again on this verse, uh, a pretty long one too, that uh, goes through the evidence and says, if you look at manuscripts in Mark chapter 1 verse 2, and you look at other places in the Gospels where there's a non-specific reference to, the prophet said this, or the prophet said that, quite often you will find that the copyists made it more specific by adding in the name of the prophet who they thought was being quoted. But the copyist did not always get it right. If you look in Matthew 13, 35, in Sinaiticus, now that good old world's oldest copy, um, you'll see that somebody wrote down that uh, when Jesus is quoting from Psalm 72, which is definitely not written by Isaiah, but somebody was thinking, who is the prophet that wrote that? Well, who is the penultimate prophet of all? It must be Isaiah. So there it is in the text. And yet, if you look in Psalm, obviously, in Psalm 72, it's not Isaiah, it's Asaph. And, uh, and Jerome addressed the same question uh, in his copies. Jerome said, you know, if the evangelist didn't make a mistake, then the copies must have. And yet, if you look at the text that, that Jerome adopted in the Vulgate, he, he kept uh, in Isaiah anyway. So, um, when, you, when you look at this, this what is often called a, a scribal habit, there was definitely a scribal habit of providing the name of an unnamed prophet. And that's what we see happening in Mark chapter 1, verse 2. And again, it doesn't happen very often relatively. We, we see in the prophets in the vast majority of manuscripts, I think, I think it's more than 97%, where it says where all the manuscripts are exactly the same in Mark chapter 1, verse 2. But because, these, because the mistake is older, it gets more respect than if the mistake had been younger. But the same, same kind of mistake, though, is, is made repeatedly in the Alexandrian text and also in some versions. Uh, and... And to get into all those details, well, that's why that's why I wrote the essays because they so they'd all be there collected in one place. So so feel free to check out the the uh, in Mark one two essay. It's it's at the blog in four pieces. 
but also you can download all four pieces at once at, at MeWe. That's good. I'm just going to piggyback off that and give uh, briefly um, some of the information about the statistics. Now, Wilbur Pickering says this. He says around 3.3% of the Greek manuscripts have Isaiah the prophet, quote-unquote, instead of, quote-unquote, the prophets to be followed by um, the critical text where he says the 96.7% are correct. And uh, then I, I just looked it up real quick, and I wanted to see kind of who was the earliest church father to actually quote it and use it. And the first one who popped up is Irenaeus. Irenaeus says this, Wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, uh, does thus commence his gospel narrative. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written. Let me change this camera back to me. Sorry about that, guys. Um, the beginning of the gospel of God, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, uh, which shall prepare thy way. The voice of the one well, crying. In the, yeah, so go ahead. Do what? In, in the case of Isaiah, uh, the, the difficulty that we, that we face when we come to his, his, uh, his form of the text is he quotes both forms. He quotes it with uh, in the prophets and with in Isaiah. And the question is, if, if there's a Latin translator of Irenaeus' works, uh, he would be far more likely to introduce the Isaiah reading more rather than the in the prophets reading because that's what his Latin text would say. Ooh, that's a good point. That's something See, to think about. The uh, uh, book against heresies, yeah, uh, we don't have most right. of it in Greek. Uh, we, we depend on a rather wooden translation of it yeah. for, for the most part. That's but, that's but, a good again, point. A, a Latin translation would would tend toward the in the in, in Isaiah reading, rather okay. than the contrary. Which is a good point. Now let's see in in Mark one two it says in the King James it says as it is written in the prophets, behold I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And if it is a reference in Isaiah, you don't see the reference in Isaiah, but you do see it in Malachi three one where it says behold I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So you see there in the very beginning, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's what the whole contention is about. Where is it at? If it, if, and that's a, that's another point, something to bring up, is if if it does in in a, in a, a different Bible version say that it is in Isaiah the prophet. How does that um, build confidence in the Word of God if it is historically and just textually inaccurate? If you go to look it up in Isaiah and you don't see it there, does that give ammunition for skeptics or for um, even even a young Christian who, who would be doing a word study and, and be like, man, I don't see it in Isaiah. The Bible must be wrong. I don't think I can trust the Bible. How does that conversation go? Where should it go and where should we go with it? Well, I think that's that's the point at which the uh, uh, the apologetic specialist would come in and say, "You see, you need me, because I can tell you what Mark's really doing there when he says that what we all know is in Malachi is in Isaiah, <laughs> because what Mark is doing is this rabbinical thing. Even though Mark's in Rome writing to Romans, he's writing as if he's writing to people that know Jewish scriptures really well." That's why he quotes specifically so often. And um, <laughs> when he's quoting and introducing, in introducing this passage, he's, he's quoting Isaiah in the sense that Isaiah is the main source. There's a, there's a little bit of Isaiah in what he's quoting. Uh, it was customary in those days not to make your quotes too exact. We see Paul uh, playing fast and loose in Romans 3 when he's quoting from the Psalms. He gets a piece here, he gets a piece there, he gets a piece there. And he doesn't differentiate exactly which Psalm he's quoting from. He just says, in the Psalms! In the Psalm. His, his friendly readers to, to sort out exactly where it's coming from. Well, yeah. that's what Mark is doing here in Mark chapter 1, verse 2. When he says, like Isaiah says, and then he's quoting from Malachi, he just reckons that his friendly readers are going to understand what he means, that Isaiah is the main prophet, and for the details, they can let it trickle down to Malachi and, and just recognize that it's from the authoritative sources of the prophets that, that they recognize. He just names Isaiah because Isaiah is the most prominent source. That's the apologist answer. Yeah. James, you're, I would say, you're eerily good at that, by the way. <laughs> I, I would say that's... That's how the apologists would say, you see, there's no error here. Yeah. And so they can afford to, to take in the 
in Isaiah, the prophet's reading, because they have this explanation. If you squint at it long enough, it'll come to you. Uh, it has to be that way. But, um, but I think that the better explanation is something that, in this case, the Byzantine text is right, and the writers in the early Alexandrian text were helping their readers out, or trying to help the readers out, by saying where the source is from, Matthew 13, verse 35, just like they do in other cases, like when, when uh, Herod's, Herod's advisors say, no, no, where's, where's the Messiah coming from? And they say, in the prophet. Which prophet? You'll find manuscripts that have you know, a little note, or even in the text. I think, uh, Micah. They'll just be a little bit more explicit and help the reader out, not to change the sense, but to make the sense more explicit. That's what's, that's basically what is going on. So they're not trying to alter things. They're trying to make it more explicit, but sometimes they themselves weren't entirely clear what they were doing. Yeah, so um, that's good. But what, what would you say to somebody who may be doubting the Bible because of that and... Uh, what what kind of advice would you give someone who who says this is in my Bible? I don't I don't think I can trust it. What do you do with that? I'd say in the case of Mark chapter one verse two, uh, the worst case scenario I think is that the the, the apologist his th his theory would 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 be um, either number one um, either, either the apologist is right or the apologist is wrong. If the apologist is wrong, then why pay attention to it when it comes to Looking into the text, go with the Byzantine text, go with what, you no, know, the, the church has handed down uh, through hundreds of years a text that says, you no, know, the Greek text I'm talking about, the Greek text that says, in the prophets. The Vulgate is where you have the problem. And uh, and again, the uh, the apologist uh, reasoning can be made to fly. It's it's, it's not an easy sell. But I, but I think most, most apologists would say, oh, yes, it's a composite quotation, so there's no error. And uh, that's where they would leave. Of course, it's it's not my problem because I don't accept that reading. You'd have to talk to one of them about that. That's good. Okay. Um. Well, it looks like I don't know. What? How do you want to wrap that up? Is there anything else you want to add to it? Oh, just just that. Um, just just touching very briefly on uh, confession of bibliology. Uh, I know we'll resume that okay. with a. Um, more momentum uh, next time. Yeah. But uh, I'd like to consider uh, three different kinds of, of equations when we have differences between the TR, the majority text, and the Nestle Allen text. That um, we have some readings what they, where it's in the TR, like, like, like the CG that we've been talking about there in 1 John 5 7. It's in the TR, but it's not nowhere close to being the majority, and it's certainly not in the Eclectic text or the Alexandrian text because it's pretty much limited to manuscripts that have been influenced by the old Latin text of First John 5, 7. Yeah. But, um, but that's one kind of variant, uh, the CJ. It's in the TR, it's not in the majority, it's not in Nussel Island, or anything that's like Nussel Island. The next one would be, uh, what do you do when you have a case where it's not in the TR, but it is in the majority text? Like in Colossians 1, 6, where you have that phrase, you know, it's, bearing, it's growing and... and, and Bearing forth fruit and growing. You know, that and growing is in most manuscripts. You know, oftentimes, in, if, if you've been exposed to, a, to some, some uh, pro-TR reasoning, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, often it's, it's presented as if there's the Antiochian line and there's the Alexandrian line. We avoid the Alexandrian line because it's just bad. And the Antiochian line, well, that's the good one. Well, when you get to 1 Corinthians, excuse me, when you get to Colossians 1.6, the pristine Byzantine line has the words and growing, but the TR doesn't. So are you really endorsing the, 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 the Byzantine line that has the words and growing? Or are you just using that as a smokescreen? Because what you're really doing is just saying the TR is always right. So that's another yeah. kind of, 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 of equation. And then the third kind is, what, what about places where... It looks like a copyist mistake that made it into both the TR and the majority text. And that would be, uh, James, James 4.12 would be one example, where there was one lawgiver hmm. who was able to save and to destroy. Or do you say there was one lawgiver and judge who was able to save and to destroy? If you compare the modern English versions, you'll, you'll see a difference there. That the, Most of the new ones will have and judge. And... Uh, that's not a majority reading. It's not in the TR either. 
but it's a reading that very much looks like it could easily have been skipped by a copyist because of the ways the letters line up. A copyist ending one word the same way it would further along ends, the line of sight could be just drifted down. What's called a, a par parablepsis could, could happen. And, and again, just uh, Google the word parablepsis, uh, P-E-R-I-B-L-E-P-S-I-S, -E -E at the blog, and you'll see several examples of those in, in a special uh, uh, entry on that. So th th those those will be three different kinds of uh, kinds of situations that I'd be curious of how how the confessional bibliologist uh, would would deal with each one of those situations in a way that does not reach the same results that would be made if a person was not just sitting back and saying, "Yeah, I'm going to say the TR is always right, and I'm not going to worry about the evidence." Well, if we do worry about the evidence, then then um, I, I want to make arguments from the evidence instead of just saying believe yeah. this because I believe it. Then uh. How would a conventional a conventional bibliologist uh, approach each one of those situations? Colossians one six, First John five seven, and James four twelve. They're, they're each one a little bit. Have, yeah, each good. one has its own little twist. Well, I'm not a confessional bibliologist, but in con Colossians one six, my answer would have to be the latter of uh, what you just stated as as evidence for accepting. Colossians 1 6 is as being what it is with not having and growing in there and that's simply because it's in the TR <laughs> I'm just kidding, but um, what what I would say I I'd, I'd, I'll just be real brief here P uh, Wilbur Pickering again. He says Although half the Greek manuscripts followed by the TR and hence uh, the authorized version New King James the modern English version and uh, the KJV ER do not have and growing the other half, including the best line of transmission, with the three most ancient versions, do. So in this case, I, I think that um, it seems like the evidence is split. It's 50-50 it's one way or the other. But to me, if you're looking at the internal witness, the internal witness is, is going to be contingent on whether or not Kai is actually um, authentic or not. If Kai is said to be authentic, then it, it shouldn't be in there. If it's said to be inauthentic, uh, then you should have and growing, or else it, it doesn't make any sense to have it the way the critical text would have it, um, uh, and therefore the authorized version would be correct, or the TR would be correct more specifically. Um, so that would be kind of my take on it. But um, what would your response be? Well, I don't, I don't know that there's a lot of evidence for arguing that just Kai or not Kai. You'd have to take the two words together. Uh, from from where the endings are, are similar, right? it, it would be if it's if it's not original, which which which, which would be the the pro KJV view, the the view that says we're going to go with the base text of the King James because that's what was handed down, that's what the people of the Westminster Confession of Faith were using, and therefore were kind of contractually obligated to endorse that text because that's our faith heritage, uh, that that's what we signed up for when we signed up for following a church that follows the Westminster Confession of Faith. So if they, yeah, you're right so about they, that. If, if they take the next logical step and go with the, the TR, the King James's base text, then they would reject it. But I don't think there's a good reason to reject it because there's a strong case that not only is it in most manuscripts, and it's in a wide array of manuscripts. You know, you got not 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 just a lot of manuscripts on one branch of the tree, but lots of branches. Yeah, but Pickering but, says it's it's split fifty fifty. Um, I, I'd have to test that, that claim that Pickering made. I, when he says split 50-50, is he talking about within the Byzantine text, within the Family 35? Or is he talking about... Uh, he doesn't get that specific, it's just his note. I'm not sh quite sure what... what I, I don't think Pickering and I would describe broad evidence or balanced evidence quite the same way. Yeah. But when you just look at the text, you'll see the endings there, and you can see how easily a copyist could skip from one point to the other. Well, and I don't doubt that, but I, if, if that's the case... Um, you're you you're saying that it would have had to have started at the very beginning with one particular copyist, and it it, it I, I mean the whole stream followed that one copyist. I think that that seems a little um difficult to believe. No, uh, I think you've got it backwards. But can you say that again? Yeah. So if 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 it did in fact have uh, have the effect of one copyist. Um, who, you know, had parablepsis or whatever, um, some sort of copyist error there that um, it, well, it he, made it into... If, if, one copyist, if, if one copyist actually skips it. Right. Yeah, yeah but that's what so I'm one, saying. You're, it seems like... 
you're saying one copyist has affected 50% of the, the manuscripts that support it, if that's a correct number. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not granting the Pickering statistic. I don't, I don't know where, where right. it's coming from. I haven't tried to verify it yet. But you're saying that it's corrupting all of the manuscripts that followed that. So when, when you have words in the text, um, it, it can either... Let me see if I can come up with an axiom that would that would that would fit this. I think it goes back to Kursop Lake, which is a, a commonality of error implies a commonality of origin. So I guess my my point would be if if that's what the um, kind of hypothesis is on how it how it's not in there, um, that, that that it should have been in there and it was changed, that we should be able to go back in history and see where and when it was changed and and not just kind of speculate at it. Well, well, we don't, we can't look over the scribe's shoulders, but when we see a reading in the text that's on this branch of transmission, on this line of trans transmission, quoted by this father over here, but also quoted in a different language over here, and all those witnesses that are for in the inclusion come from different locales and different and and, and different independent branches, and instead of coming from one one line that's kind of isolated, yeah, uh, then you have strong support for the inclusion of it. All it would take would be a copy of Snow making a copy that's then used by others to omit it. And also, it's the kind of mistake that could be made, I'm not saying it was made, but, but this kind of mistake uh, could, could be repeated without any uh, cooperation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, it's, but um, I don't, it, if something was taken out versus added in, I guess either way you should be able to trace it and actually see when it was added in. You're just saying it's too difficult to do that? Um, not in all cases. Some, sometimes there are special factors involved, but um, but in this case, uh, if you were to kind of map the evidence, uh, just kind of, and, and again, you would actually have to you know you use maps and say, here we have this version over here, here we have this patristic writer over here, we've got, we've got this this guy making this version over here. Yeah. If you could look at that broad attestation, then again, uh, commonality. You, you, you can also go the other way and say commonality. Uh, also implies a common origin when it's not an error. In other words, you go back to the autograph. You, you're, you're implying the or, or the archetype when when you have all these witnesses. They, they've got to be. Uh, if you ever pictured a grenade exploding, and then kind of watched it explode and reverse, slow down the tape, and the pieces yeah. get closer and closer together. After a certain point, uh, the tape stops, and because we just don't have enough evidence to go on, once you get back around the year 200. <clears throat> And, uh, but when we see, if you start up the tape and we get that picture in the 300s and 400s, and here's the grenade, and at this point, the reading is here and here and here and here and here, then we have really good evidence to say that's the original reading. So do we, do you, do you actually know, um, have a pretty good idea of when and where it seems to have been taken out? I would say somewhere in the, um, Byzantine line, obviously, because the text is receptive, that doesn't have it. But I would have to do some 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 more digging to see what the exact percentages are. P Pickering made that state statement, but I haven't been able to verify it. Okay, but um, what about a timeline? Uh, say on a linear time, when 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 do you think that that change would have been made uh, in the way that you see it that it sh that it shouldn't have been? Uh, the short well, reading. Well, if Stephen Swanson had lived a little longer, we'd have a copy of uh, Colossians. <laughs> and we just uh, look look at his evidence and and, and line up about forty five men. But I but I I, yeah. I I would suspect just off the top of my head, I'd suspect that it wouldn't be hard to uh, look at several ancient witnesses like Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, but also look in the Western text and, and see what see what Codex Codex D says, uh, see what some others say, see what Codex Macedonianus says, and uh, and, yeah. and, the, and the Pope on shields. Have, well, not, not no, not that because that's the Gospels. Actually, there's just gospels too. Hold on, um, <laughs> it's, it's getting late. <laughs> Rewind all that. You know what uh, we need. But we could look. We, we could look at Claude Montanus. There you go. The other day, and um, and we could could just do a little digging, and it shouldn't be too hard to find out what's the earliest point at which it was there. Yeah. What's the earliest point at which it was there? And I would suspect that we'll see it not there uh, in the Middle Ages, maybe. Uh, unless there's some virginal evidence that I'm not aware of, aware of, which which there very well could be, but but that'd be my my approach. So all right, so um, that's not you, the end of the journey, but that's how we started out. You think the CBGM is going to be able to do exactly what we're talking about doing right there? Um, 
when it comes to just uh, answering that that simple question, uh, I'd say they could do something like that with the, with the mapping. Yeah. Um, it's just just a matter of plugging in the data. It, it, it take a little work using the CBGM. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it labor intensive, but I think it could be estimated pretty well. That'd be pretty cool um, to see kind of what the results are on something like that. But anyways, I'm I'm gonna wrap up, man. I'm getting I've got to get up okay. in about four hours. So, anyways, okay. thanks again, James, for coming on. Uh, welcome to uh, <laughs> coming back, and I don't know what I'm talking about. It's part two, and uh, it looks like we're gonna be doing a part three. Maybe we'll get into a couple other variants and and see if we can make it happen. So, thanks again for coming on. Okay. And uh, may maybe that, that very question might be a good question to ask Peter Gurry uh, about, you know, can yeah. the CDGM map things in that way? That would that, yeah. be a good follow up on with him. Cool. Yeah, perfect. So, cool. Well, have a good night. I'm going to close it out, go to our closing scene, and then we will wrap it up. So, thanks again. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Let's see there. Should have that. All right. It's late again just like every time we do one of these podcasts. But uh, that was the first time we, we we disagreed pretty good, and that was on 1st John 5-7. Um, but it was fun, man. That's that's what it's about. We're, we disagree, but we can talk about it. We can, we can he, And obviously, he knows a lot more about the Greek than I do. I'm a rookie, but um, I'm learning. So um, I'm gonna, I've got my work cut out for me, but we've got upcoming um, dates to consider. It's going to be the 11th. And uh, the 29th is going to be that the the next broadcast with Peter Gurry, Jeff Riddle, and James Snap Jr. And then I've got a, a debate that we're doing with Louis Dizon, uh, the Roman Catholic apologist on the doctrine of justification. And then we're going to do a debate with uh, a uh, an atheist um, agnostic, um, Randy Krakowski. We're going to be debating on the moral argument, the origin of morality. And finally, uh, I've got one more debate. What is that over? Um, I can't remember the other debate that we're doing. Oh, actually, it's Rethinking Hell with Chris Date. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Annihilationism versus Eternal Conscious Torment. That should be a lot of fun. So anyways, guys, thanks for sticking with in with us. Please like and share the videos, rate and subscribe us um, in Apple iTunes or whatever podcast you're listening to us in. And uh, that's all I've got. Have a good night. Talk to you later.